Okay, so this lecture is about evolutionary morphology, which is understanding the diversity and non-randomness of form. We divide evolutionary morphology into two different categories. The first is functional morphology, which is how the function of an organism relates to its form. And the second is theoretical morphology, comparing the spectrum of conceivable forms to those that actually evolved. A really useful way to think about um, how any individual form or structure in an organism evolved is Silacher's triangle. And this is a little picture of Dolph Silacher in the corner there. And so there's three apices to Silacher's triangle, history and phylogeny, functional adaptive, and structural and physical constraints. And little x's within the triangle represent different traits. So an example of a history or a phylogenetic um, trait would be our tailbones. We have tailbones because we used to have tails. They are an example of our past and our phylogenetic relatedness to other organisms. <clears throat> an example of a functional or adaptive trait would be our opposable th thumbs. We have them, they're super useful, they're functional and adaptive for us now. In terms of structural and physical constraints, you can think of things like the fact that there are no animals with wheels because the sort of structure of creating um, ball bearings out of tissue is pretty tricky, um, or the fact that whales can't fly. Uh, so every single trait, of course, falls not on one apices or the other, but is usually some combination of the three. So it's just a useful way to think about traits um, in general, and specifically um, when we think about their function. Okay, so first we're going to talk about functional morphology. Um, one good example is in the trilobites. So here's a figure from the textbook that looks at the different lifestyles of trilobites in the Paleozoic. So some of them um, were in faunal, which means that they burrowed. Some of them crawled around on the seafloor. Um, some of them actually swam. So they had lots and lots of different um, ways of living. And this is reflected in their morphology. So a great example of this are trilobites with well-developed eyes. Um, so you can see here, these trilobites all have really big eyes and their heads sort of stick out and their eyes wrap around the sides of their heads. And all of these taxa are swimming trilobites, which makes sense. If you're swimming, you need to look not only in front of you, but above you and below you. Whereas if you're on the seafloor, you really only need to look in front of you and above you. You don't need um, a greater than sort of 90 degree angle. And so here we can use the um, structure of the trilobite's eyes to infer something about their function and how these organisms lived. Now trilobite eyes in general are just super fascinating. Um, there's two main kinds of trilobite eyes. The first are the uh, hollow croil eyes. I never know if I'm saying that right, but that's fine. Um, and here's a couple pictures of them. And uh, the other are the uh, schizocroyal eyes. So if we look at hollow croil eyes, so each one of the little um, pieces of the eye is an individual calcite crystal. And basically the way this works is that light comes through um, each of these little lenses perpendicular to the surface of the crystal. And so each lens can only see light that comes in at an angle almost perpendicular to the surface of the lens. So basically only things that are straight in front of it. This is essentially how modern compound eyes and insects work too. Pretty low resolution images um, and a large mosaic of very narrow images. So the lenses are uh, placed on a curved surface, as you can see in the pictures, to create a wild, wide field of vision. The other kind of eyes are schizocroyal eyes, and these have rounded lenses. This is actually an example of patamorphosis. So the eyes of immature holocroyal Cambrian eye trilobites are basically miniature schizocroyal eyes. Um, in the group of trilobites called the phacopsids, these were retained via delayed growth of these immature stru structures into the adult form. And these eyes are actually much more sophisticated um, and they enabled light to come in at multiple angles. One of the really cool things is that these lenses look almost exactly the same as um, drawings for aplanic lenses published by Descartes and Huygens shown in these diagrams here um, that were basically coming up with like the theory of how light moved through lenses and the trilobites figured it out you know 400 million years ago. Pretty neat. So one of the things that we can do when it's maybe less obvious what the um, function of a trait is 
is we can test the ecology of extinct organisms using physical models. So the book had this diagram that basically shows how we can compare things like um, different parts of a joint or a skull uh, to different things that we're familiar with, like um, fulcrums on a pair of pliers or wheelbarrows um, or a pair of tweezers. So we can use our understanding of physics and mechanics um, to understand how organisms function. So one fun example of this is this cool early uh, Carboniferous crinoid. It had these really um, interesting wing plates on the ventral side. And so people weren't really sure um, what the actual life position or function of this was. And so some scientists went out and actually made a little model. So they put a strain gauge and some ball bearings, and then they made this little wire mesh hemisphere that simulates the crinoid in its feeding, feeding position, and the diamond-shaped plate simulates the little wing plate. And so the ball bearings allow it to sort of swing passively in a current, and so they moved it from a, in a current on a tank where the water moved from left to right. So here are the results of the experiment. So on the um, left-hand side, the open squares are models with plates and the closed squares are models without plates or closed circles. And you can see that um, the speed on the x-axis and the force against the plate on the y-axis, there's really no difference. So there's no difference in drag between the models with and without wing plates. But if we look at the second one, now we're looking at the angle and the force, so the angle that the crinoid model was facing in, and you can see quite a big difference. So forces with a positive sign are those that cause the wire mesh ball to turn into the current. So the models with plates are able to reorient passively into the current and therefore get more food, whereas the models without the plates are not. And so it wasn't drag. Um, after, via this experiment, they were able to show that it wasn't drag, but it was something else um, moving into the current that was actually the function of that big wing plate. Um, and similar things are done. This is another um, interesting <coughs> crinoid clade that um, seems to have grown off of a, of a log or a float. Um, and here, basically, similar thing where scientists used sort of a tone net analogy in order to um, understand the function of these very strange crinoids. The book talks pretty extensively about the functional morphology of T. rex legs um, and how, you know, how do sort of Hollywood Jurassic Park type people come up with how T. rex runs um, and how paleontologists and physiologists actually use models to figure out um, how the joints would move, how the forces would be um, accommodated through those joints and along muscles to try to figure out um, the actual stride and movement of things like T-Rex.